What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Live Free Podcast. Lex, we are back. Yes, we are. Um, I'm I'm hosting this thing. I'm Mike Maxwell, producer Lex on board, making this sound super sweet. Yeah, as always. Uh, and we're wait, uh, we skipped last week, but we're doing yeah. two in one month. So I mean, that's a that's a move up. We uh, we were on the. Oh, well, I was doing like one, like maybe a month. Yeah, we're getting the schedule of like my busy schedule, and then kind of working things out yeah it's making sense now yeah we're, yeah. we're back on on schedule the new year i got this um i've been using this thing called um passion planner which sounds like i'm like planning a wedding which you're doing right no no no. i've, I've been married oh you already got married yeah i already. thought you were still planning a, a wedding no okay uh That'd anyway be the worst three years of planning a marriage yeah uh, doesn't that happen <laughs> isn't that, isn't that <laughs> that's the way it goes no, it's just like a like a fucking day planner thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it breaks everything down into like a really cool, like easy to use chart situation. Oh, okay. To where like so I'm the type of person that even like I'll I'll write down notes of shit that I need to do, but a lot of times I'll just ignore it and not uh, do it. Yeah. But this has everything broken down by hour, so I've been planting things that I need to do in the hour that I need to do them. Okay. And somehow it's allowing me to like move forward and do them and not procrastinate. Yeah, Which is a big a thing with podcasts. Like, it's easy to procrastinate on, like, doing all the work of a podcast. Yeah. So I need that just in general to like to uh, manage my lollygagging. That yeah, totally. Yeah. That's and I'm what it is is like. And another thing is like you get a lot of shit done and then you forget that you did it and then you don't really give yourself the credit that you deserve for getting some shit done. <laughs> so it's nice to be go back and be like, fuck, I had a full day of shit that I got done. Yeah. I'm going to chill today. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, because so, sometimes it's like, man, I got a lot of shit to do, but fuck it. I'm just going to chill. Yeah. That, so I'm so. really enjoying that. Um, we got uh, Christian Rex Van Minen, another goddamn long ass artist named Jesus fucking Christ. I want to go with Minen or something like that. Um, you trying to put like a extra German accent on yeah, it? Yeah, I'm probably sure. It'd Meaning, be like that. Meaning. 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 <laughs> but we'll find out. Yeah, we will find out. So I guess we should just jump right into this thing. What do you think? Yeah, let's do it. All right, let's give Christian a call. Can you hear the fucking alarm outside? A little bit. Hopefully, it goes off. Hey, Mr. Christian Rex Van Minen. All right, so here's the thing. Artists on the show all the time have all these goddamn crazy-ass <laughs> names, uh-huh. and you fit right into that category today. I got lucky with my name, yeah. Yeah, it's very, it's, um, it sounds prestigious. Uh, I, I imagine, <laughs> <clears throat> like, metal helmets with pointy things on the top, you know? I, I, like, what? like a, like an Austrian or something? Yeah, like German Chancellor, like. 1890 or something if they had chancellors or maybe um uh i don't even know what to call like like some prussians right yeah, those so are the prussians eastern no, europe it, it's dutch. dutch it's uh yeah my dad is rex van minen and then oh. so i basically got his name plus the christian part interesting what uh i was also named after my father but i was named after him because i was born on his birthday oh yeah you just get hit with the name? Yeah, yeah. And it was like when he came to the U.S., they capitalized the V. And so I made it lowercase. Just that's to, right. Uh, hey, so uh, the microphone that's on the on the headphones, if it just uh-huh. clips, it makes a bunch of like fuzzy. Oh, okay. Fuzzy fuzziness. I'll try to stay still. Yeah. So you, you just have to not move for an hour. Yeah. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Now, those those fucking microphones will be pains in the asses sometimes. Yeah, uh, maybe I could tape it or something. Well, if worse, you could take the headphones out and just use like your computer mic. It should be fine. Okay. If need cool. Be. Uh, so you went ahead and just drop dropped the V back down to the lowercase V. Yeah, yeah. That's how the rest of my family spells it. Um, it's just not you know I, I get a lot of hard a hard time with my name like especially you know, registering for anything or having an account in places, it's usually like Minin or they put it all in one word or, you know, I I just, I've come to, you know, get used to that. Embrace it, right? I I recently, this last year, my last solo show that I did, 
I decided to use my full name, the entire name. To sound, I noticed that. It's, and it really it does. It sounds like more like official for some reason. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it seems so silly. I think, um, fuck, I think it was uh, the guy who did Outliers did some. Maybe it was him. Maybe it was like Freakonomics or something. But like the importance of your name and mm-hmm. like how it affects your life as you grow older, like in terms yeah. of like getting jobs or like. Uh, you know, like getting some special grant or something like that, how your yeah. name like sort of will set you on a particular path, which seems so strange. But it's so true. It's so true. I mean, going from being kind of like made fun of for my name to having like this totally out of proportion sense of self-importance because <laughs> of it. <laughs> it's true, man. So yeah. uh, you grew up on the East Coast? Uh, yeah, I was born in... Rhode Island, uh, but my family only lived there till I was five, and then we moved to Colorado. That's kind of a, yeah. a pretty big transition from uh, like Rhode Island town to living in the mountains. Yeah, well, we we moved to Denver, so it's just right at the okay, uh, and then then moved to the mountains when I was in high school. We I moved. I've been moving around a lot my whole life, but um, yeah, it was very different. You know, Did, were you uh, what? What was the cause of moving around a lot? Folks' jobs or, um, yeah, I guess just sort of jobs. Um, my dad was a minister in uh, in Rhode Island, and then got a job as a hospital chaplain. Is is what brought us to Denver, and I think it was because it was cheap. You know, yeah, it, it was during this kind of mass exodus from Denver, and so real estate was really inexpensive, and I think that also helped. And then when my parents divorced, my mom stayed in Denver and my dad moved up to the mountains. So that was the reason for that. But, and you're now painting out of New York, right? Yep. Yeah, in Brooklyn. So did, uh, did your folks sort of set you up on a, on a creative pathway? Did like, did you find art at an early age? Yeah, definitely. You know, they're very, uh, yeah, they're pretty eccentric. Um, <laughs> well, both I mean, of them have, I would say a pastor is oftentimes a performer, d- depending on the type of church maybe that they're in. But there's often mm-hmm. a, there's a, definitely a performance aspect to leading a a congregation, right? Oh, totally. Yeah, and uh, you know, after we left Rhode Island, he never ministered any longer. He was a minister in the American Baptist Church, which is a little different from what you think of. Um, in terms of Baptists, they're a little more um, subdued and progressive than uh-huh. than Southern Baptist. Right. Um, so I I have some recollection of him ministering. You know, no snake but, handling or anything. No, none of that. There was like no. I, I think you know. There's like 17 different sects of Baptist, and theirs was more progressively at least politically inclined yeah um and and sort of reserve that new england kind of reserve sure um but i I remember drawing on those little pieces of paper behind the pews at church uh you know just that's and that that i was always drawing since then so and did you you know did you find so i always talk about how like i recognize like i got some sort of uh attention from making things at oh, yeah. early age. Did you recognize that like a, a like a skill set that maybe set you aside or Oh totally. I mean I my parents were always very um encouraging and didn't like ever call me weird <laughs> or or censor what I was doing. Um and then once I got to Denver, it was just sort of a hostile environment. And so I think that drawing and and um, it kind of protected me a little yeah. bit. It was really crime ridden. Denver was pretty gnarly back in the in the eighties, right? Yeah, depending on where you lived. Yeah. Um, and it was it was hard, you know. Like I I got it was very violent and very. Um, that was a rough rough patch there, pretty much through middle school. And then I moved to the mountains, and it was like peaceful, and I had friends and. Yeah. girls to me it was pretty awesome what do you think the difference is there do you think it's just like the stresses that people are involved in day to day just like affect 
you know, like kids in school, you know, what is it that like makes such a big change? Is it the amount of people? You mean between Denver public schools and. Yeah. Or I mean, you know, just in in general, like I think a lot of people face that sort of thing. Yeah. um, I think poverty has a lot to do with it. And, you know, uh, I wasn't, I definitely wasn't in the um, ethnic majority. Yeah. And so, you know, I think I got a lot of, uh, I got picked on a lot for that yeah, reason. Just for standing out. It's amazing. Yeah, just for being yeah. being the white boy. It's a motherfucker <laughs> being different sometimes, you know? Yeah. And you don't really yeah. realize it until you're put into that position as the, you know, air quote, other. No, exactly. And then moving to Carbondale, it was like, you know, predominantly white and... Um, and that's another wealthy. interesting thing. And there was a few Latino kids, and, and I, I saw it from the other perspective, and it was like, it was, um, it was good to have both perspectives. You it know? seems to be that that's what keeps races apart, you know? Like, I, it, it's weird. Like, we, it seems like everybody sort of is more comfortable grouping with people who are, that look more like them. You yeah. know what I mean? Like even and we we were talking my poker game we had a poker game oh yeah I do a weekly poker game and we're mm-hmm. a pretty diverse crowd because we're all martial artists and in the martial arts there's like really diverse groups of people that hang out mm-hmm. that has in, we bond over the thing that we all do together so it really doesn't have anything to do with ethnic cultural uh, you know the sure. amount of money that you make or whatever because it's all right there but when we're out in society it really does like matter some somehow like even if it's subconscious you know like we just we just realize that like if there's a group of us who are the same and there's somebody who's other we're going to group with the people who are the same even if it doesn't have even if it's not like i hate the other group it's even if it's just like a comfort level yeah but that tribalism is kind of a hindbrain thing that's hard to escape and it it's it sucks. Yeah, you know? even with the science that we have, we all know that we're all made up of all the same shit. That we're all, are, if you get down to the mm. DNA aspect of it, we're all basically the same thing with just the like minutest amounts of differences, like just mm-hmm. yeah. minuscule, barely yeah. affordable, barely detectable. But we see ourselves as completely different. Well, we're all we're all scared, you know. We're all full of fear. Yeah, and, that's where it, that's what it lies is this yeah. being afraid of one another. You know what's crazy is that yeah. when you put kids in together in that situation, they don't generally like go to people that they look like. They go to genders. If yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. So it's, if it's not like something, if you it's look not at, one it's thing, it's the other. Then so they gender separate yeah. each other. That's yeah, it, it it seems natural, but not natural at the same time. Somehow, I don't know. It, it's it's very it's strange. A complicated issue. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, I've had some complicated um, experiences with that. that I mean, I, I'm preoccupied with it and conflicted yeah. and confused, just as anybody. So at what point do you start painting? I, I, I think it's interesting, too, to find out about like the early uh, religious aspects. I think there's a lot of that stuff that shows up in your work, so I, I definitely want sure. to get into that. Um, but So did you go to art school? I went to uh, college. You know, and they had an art department there. It wasn't an art school. It was a small Jesuit university in Denver. And um, did, were you painting already by then? Yeah, I had this really amazing high school art teacher that, you know, saw that I could draw really well and that I was motivated. Um, and she basically just put me in a corner and gave me oil paints when I was 14 <laughs> or 15. Yeah. And she just, you know, showed me the basics and I was off. You know, nice. and I I just took to it immediately. You know, I just really love, I guess, the escape of it. You know, sure. uh, just that I was able to kind of check out of reality. Uh-huh. And, I think uh, that I think a, a lot of people miss that. That's a big part of this thing. Of yeah, stuff. And yeah. again, I make like with the martial arts analogy, the same thing happens with that too. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like everything that sucks and like stresses you out goes away. Yeah, you On know, I I. I I know that you're really into the Brazilian jiu-jitsu stuff, and uh, I envy that. You know, I, I tried it for a couple of years, but since my son was born, I haven't had a lot of time to, to do it. 
Yeah. But I really enjoyed it. It was really a great release and kind of discipline. I really like that. How old is your son? He's 19 months. Oh, baby, baby. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, maybe by the time he gets old enough, like five or six, you can jump back in there. Bring him and he, him as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a place right across the street from us on Myrtle Avenue. That's a actual Brazilian Jiu Jitsu school. Nice. Uh, what is it? What, do you know the name? Um, oh, shit. I don't know, but I saw a UFC guy there. Oh, I don't really? remember. I want to say it was Nogira. Nogira. That's who I I train at his gym here in San Diego. He's a big dude with big cauliflower ears and like. There's a lot of those dudes. <laughs> yeah. <It> doesn't <laughs> he necessarily. Really bro. <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, I would love to get him into that and eventually get myself back into it. I really like that. Yeah, man, you should. It, and it, it's some. It's really strange. I found a lot of painters who are also jujitsu players. Yeah. There's something that correlates somehow. I'm not sure what. It might just be the addictive personality. Yeah, Compulsive. yeah, and it's a good complementary practice to being in your head and isolated all the time yeah. and not having an outlet for aggression and anger. For sure, I tell a lot. That's a, the big thing for a lot of people. Like, as mm-hmm. men, especially you know, like let's say like nine to fivers who are in an office all day, or somebody like you and I who sit in a studio by ourselves all day, or you know, mm-hmm. like there we. We're so we still have that monkey brain that needs to like roll around and fight and, and you see it and I feel like a, a lot of times those stresses that come out are a big part of people not being able to release those energies whatever the fuck it is that we have this need to like be like Grr! you know you but within it? within the context of sport so there's like right it's a it's a positive environment to unleash yeah. those things and can be done in a, a controlled environment as opposed to like you freaking yeah. out in traffic or on the train or you know, <laughs> yeah. somebody cut you off and you want to fucking fight to the death all of a sudden yeah. for something so minute but when you fucking yeah. are in there if you fight every day or you know a couple of days a week then you don't really give a shit about, <laughs> about all those other things because you know it's stupid but yeah, for some reason, I mean, if you build it up, you can't like filter what's stupid and what's not. Yeah, maybe I don't know. I guess, I think it gives you an awareness of your own, um, like what what to do with anger. You know. Yeah. But yeah. if you can effectively view your anger objectively and and funnel it in the right way, you know, that's that's yeah, a great yeah. asset. And it almost it happens inadvertently like I, I i talk about how you know before if like a fight broke out even if i didn't have anything to do with it right like a bar fight breaks out like yeah. all of a sudden your adrenaline starts pumping oh yeah you you know you get tunnel vision like you make bad choices you do stupid shit that you wouldn't normally do if you weren't in it like a highly alert like a stress like mm-hmm. brain function and what i found is that from doing this now is that that goes away and instead mm-hmm. of like crazy fear and like brain going a million miles an hour, everything slows down and everything becomes yeah. really clear, really slow and focused. And there's none of that like stress. My heart isn't going a hundred miles an hour. It's like a weird calm that comes when there's that environment breaks out, you know? So do you, do you experience that a lot in San Diego? <laughs> I mean, it happens, but not really, you know? And that's the other funny thing is as soon as you learn how to fight, you really don't find yourself in, you find yourself in environments where you might need to fight, <laughs> you know? Well, yeah. There's always that, a chance, is, but... I would imagine just everybody in Southern California knows how to fight. <laughs> <laughs> like, you would be surprised, you, dude. Not very many people know how to fight at all, really. I don't know. I think the game's changed a little bit, you know. I yeah. wouldn't go out looking for bar fights nowadays. No, no, no. I definitely would not do that either, but you'd be surprised. The It's funny to be able to watch so my gym also has strikers in it, so there's Muay Thai practitioners as well. So which I don't do, but I get to watch people who actually know how to punch and kick. Yeah, and it's so different. Like people come in, they're like, "Oh, I did Taekwondo for ten years," and they like go with a beginner Muay Thai fighter, and they're like, "Oh, I'm fucked." Like, <laughs> they they get to actually see like what somebody can actually do, like a real punch and a real kick, and it's totally different. Like yeah. I laugh like when I see like little essay fights and kids just swinging like 
like big left hooks and big right hooks just winging their punches around. And if somebody back. just punched them like one punch down the tube, they would be done. But, you know, that's people just... And that's the thing is people panic, people's adrenaline start pumping, and mm-hmm. they just go crazy. But that doesn't happen when you're in those environments, luckily. And, you know, maybe the same thing kind of happens with painting. I know for me, I would paint wild before I knew what the fuck I was doing. Before I could, mm. like, really, like, come together and, like, figure out what goes with what and, and what have you. So, uh, at what point did you really focus on the painting? Um, you finished college and then, mm. you know, I, you know, like, most people go to college and they're like, oh, I'm going to get a job and... Uh, yeah i mean i I graduated in 2002 and then traveled a little bit and um you know i was just painting um without much method but it was very just fundamentally surrealistically and uh i didn't actually start picking up the technique that i'm using now until about 2006 Okay. when I started doing my own research into the old masters uh-huh. and particularly Rembrandt and the Dutch golden age. Sure. And which, uh, I guess, man, I, you know, I, I, I can't remember when I started seeing your work, but I'll tell you something that popped into my head, like almost immediately when I did, um, growing up here in San Diego, I, where my high school was, there was a guy who lived down just maybe like, uh, two blocks from the school who had uh, elephantitis really bad, mm. like mm. really bad. And I remember the very first time I saw him, I was walking to school and I, it was like day after Halloween. And I looked over and I saw somebody's face. Like I saw a, a, a like a person, but there was something distorted. It, and it was far enough away that I like my brain didn't like put all the pieces together. And mm-hmm. my head said like, why is that guy still wearing a mask? It's fucking oh. Halloween it was like two days or three days ago. What the fuck is going on? And then I looked over again and I realized what the fuck was going on. Oh, and like he, it was re- his nose like came all the way down to like his chest and you couldn't mm-hmm. see one eye. Like there was a lot of fold over and like a lot of like really stretched like like it looked like his skin hurt. Like it was red <laughs> and stretched and sore. And I got it was really strange. Like I got scared. And it sounds mm-hmm. like, like, what a shithead to say you got scared by somebody with elephantitis. But it li- literally, like, a fear. Like, and it, maybe it's not fear, but, like, my heart sunk. You know, like, something, and it was like I saw a car accident, almost, you know? And yeah. so now, when I see a lot of your work, I think of that guy a lot. Who, he passed away, um, unfortunately, a, f- a few years ago. But I, I would always see him, and it, it would always, like, break my heart. Like, I felt sure, really yeah. bad for him. But at the same time, I kind of, like, had this, uh, like, weird, almost like, I don't want to say hatred, but, like, I, w- I would feel, like, uh, stressed when I saw him. Like, I'd be like, damn, yeah. I saw him again. Like, it was like, I was, I, if I could have, in fact, I worked at this store that was in the neighborhood, and he would come into the store sometimes, and I would, like, try to, like, hide in the back one like real empathetic like i really felt bad for him like that he had to live this particular life and but on the other hand there was a part of me that was like grossed out and it sounds so douchey to say it like that but like it was so distorted that it made me feel so uncomfortable that i tried to avoid it does that make sense well yeah it does and i think that empathy is difficult it requires a lot of energy you know yeah so it's why you don't want to like you you feel an incredible amount of compassion for the you know homeless guy on the corner with no shoes and his feet bleeding, but you don't stop and commiserate and you know <laughs> yeah you know it, it's Touch like him on the shoulder that's a really yeah you want to but it's like what would that actually take what would that actually require of you at in that moment yeah. and uh, there's I, that tension is important. You know, that's, that's kind of what I, that's the emotional space I want to explore and and be in when I'm making work, Uh you know? And I think because you're looking at a static image in reference to my own work, you're allowed that voyeurism that you wouldn't be allowed in, in real time. Yeah. You know, you're allowed to kind of be voyeuristic and explore it and have that time, um, without much accountability. Yeah, because in, in, 
on some level too, like let's say, you know, I had a conversation with this guy. I had to on some level pretend that the that what was happening wasn't actually happening, you know? Like right. if you're and feeling from his this perspective he's like, Oh come on, man. Like, this, this, <laughs> yeah. like yeah. Everyone yeah. pretends Did you see like it? The thing Did you see happening. that movie um, Under the Skin? Uh, that uh, with the, the Scarlett, Scarlett Johansson. Johansson. Yeah, she's the girl that picks up all the guys and brings them back to the yeah. lair. Yeah, she has that. She picks up the guy who's got the elephantitis. And... That's right. I thought that that was a fucking uh, that that was oh. just a costume, but that's really the dude. That was. I mean, there were no less than a dozen moments in that movie where I was just like, "Holy shit!" They did it. They went there. Like, yeah. thank God, this movie's made for me. <laughs> yeah, I really enjoyed it. I liked how it looked. I wasn't sure about the story. Yeah, but I really liked. I like. I like films that don't necessarily have to have a like linear plot line. I agree. I, I totally agree with you. I mean, it's it's like. Just uh, use utilize suspension of disbelief, and it's like okay, this is reality. Let's accept it. Yeah. And and now what? That's I such like a that. I I love that that opportunity in that media in the medium of film and it, that that film in particular. And there's a lot of uh, what did I just see? I I thought Birdman was very interesting too. In that like it oh, doesn't it, yeah. it doesn't feel like a film. It's it's not the same as Under the Skin. Like Under the Skin is a very sort of surrealistic it reminds me of a like a kind of like a painting like there's that scene of all the trees blowing and mm, there's like a mm-hmm. superimposed version of her on the trees or something and it looks like they're yeah. breathing like they're all like like everything's on mushrooms kind of which kind of reminded me of like some von trier shots mm-hmm. have you seen um melancholia yeah yeah that was remind me movie. a lot of, of that there's some yeah. interesting um, painting references in that movie, like the um, when uh, what's the the main actress's name, the blonde girl. I don't know which, what movie that is. She got uh, leaked with some nudes. I keep wanting to say Claire. But, uh, uh, she got leaked shit. with nudes. Yeah. Kirsten Dunst. Kirsten Dunst. Oh. There's yeah. the scene where she's laying in the stream naked, mm. and the, I forget who the there's a famous painting that, that it resembles. Ophelia. Ophelia. I, I think Ophelia has been painted by a lot of different painters. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know how we got off on the tangent of, my, <laughs> but uh, well, with Under the Skin, yeah, yeah. I I, I fucking love um, Scarlett Johansson too. I wonder if I could yeah. put that out there. Hopefully the wifey doesn't hear. <laughs> She's great, man. Even back yeah. like uh, Ghost World. She was in Ghost that? World. Yeah, yeah, she's in yeah. Ghost World. She's the no friend. Way. Was of she like twelve? Maybe like sixteen or something, but I wow. think she started I... young. I know <laughs> it's so creepy. That's such a weird like. I I mean I guess as artists we start doing the thing young, but I don't like if I see like a sixteen year old artist like getting gallery shows and doing things. I think it's like kitschy bullshit most of the time. Mm. But we see a lot of actors start like in their fucking you know preteen years. And work all the way through, you know, they get fucked up. But it's such a weird environment for people to go into, like, working as a child. I think it makes, especially as, as an artist in whatever field, it makes it more difficult to self-realize. You know, I think when you, when you start out that young, you create this identity and you get so much value from affirmation because mm-hmm. what you're doing is good, then... You know, it's hard to detach from that. You know, I, I experienced that. I think it's hard know. to detach from that as an adult. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe yeah, it, make, it, makes, it makes you question like, what, who, and why am I? Who am I doing this for, and and why? Yeah, um, that's a big issue, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Do you good. think that comes with age, though? Yeah. How old are you? Yeah, thirty-five. I'll be thirty-five on Monday. Yeah. Yeah, happy birthday. Yeah. Thanks. I saw you were going to do something over at the Met. Give, yeah, you know. yeah. I, uh, you know, I've been really fascinated with this painter. Um, his name is Otto Marseus von Schrick. And he was a Dutch Golden Age painter and part of this weird little clique that um, would do these pilgrimages to Rome from the Netherlands and, and learn the, the Venetian techniques and, and other Italian techniques and uh-huh. be down there and then go back north. Um, 
anyway, I, I, he's one of my favorite painters. He's really unique. He did these little Sada Bosco style still lights, so these little forest floor scenes. Um, and he's only got maybe a dozen works that are known, and maybe just one or two are here in the States. And this one has been in the Met storage room for God knows how long. Wow. So I went in there and had to like jump through four different hoops to get to the right person to, you know, talk them into giving me 20 minutes with this painting alone on, on Monday. (laughs) Yeah. I feel really special to be able to do that. You know, it's going to be interesting. I bet. Yeah. Yeah. You um you just you just had a show in New York this past week, right? This month? Um I did a little group show here in New York and then I had a solo show in Denver. Okay. Uh, yeah. How uh how, how was that show? The was your solo, solo show? show? Yeah. It was great. It was really wonderful. I mean, it's a huge space. So it was, I did a bunch of really big paintings for it, which was new for me. Yeah, uh, it was a different experience, and they hung it really beautifully. It was a huge opening. Um, unlike a lot of these other places, that, that I, there's a lot of people that I know that came to the show, so that was really, really nice. How how, how do you usually work in a, a smaller format for? Yeah, yeah. I mean, mo- my comfort zone is definitely like the intimate scale portrait or still life, you know, kind of 18 by 24 yeah. on average so that it's one-on-one, you know, like there's not a lot of room for multiple people to be viewing it at once. It's kind of intended to be very personal and intimate. And when you scale up, it changes that. Yeah. I feel it changes the feeling for me. Um, it, it broadens the audience literally and figuratively. What about so, technique wise? Did you notice any significant changes besides like the size of brushes? Did you notice? Anything? Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, well, geez, I, I never, I didn't really use different size brushes, which makes it difficult, but <laughs> still um, using the small ones. <laughs> yeah. And you know, my tendency is to make things so complicated. I just love complexity. Uh-huh. And so the challenge in working with larger works was allowing for some space and not, not filling up every little square inch right? and, and breaking shapes down to where, you know, from a distance that doesn't make sense. You know, so so allowing for larger forms to exist was a huge challenge, yeah. um, and I, I failed in the past, I think, in, in doing that. And you know, that's so, always where you learn, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was tough, but it's rewarding. Um, I wrote down uh, decadence and gluttony as a uh, mm-hmm. part of my notes. Is uh, some of the work that uh, you've done in the past, and some of the new things that you're doing now. Um, like I said, there's a lot of uh, sort of religious symbolism, I think, shows up in the work. Mm. E- even like your use of uh, like the grape skin or the, mm. you know, the fruit skin that, that shows up in what is now like the human skin. On some yeah. level, I see uh, a sort of, I guess, maybe a critique of gluttony or um, excessive behavior, maybe. It, you know, and this is, of course, my own interpretation. Um, and, of course, like the use of pigs in, you know, mm-hmm. like in gowns. And, you know, was it, is there something that you're implanting in there from that perspective? I mean, you're, you're looking at a lot of these old Dutch master paintings, which sometimes were, uh, you know, celebrating uh, high class lifestyles of some sort, or even like mm-hmm. the still lifes are of things that would probably be found in someone who is wealthy, someone's home, like a wealthy environment of some sort. Yeah. Um, do you see yourself making comments towards, you know, maybe our own modern Western gluttony at all, or, you know, the decadence of, you know, we were in this like 1%, 99% world? Sure. Um, well, I, I don't know if it's such a moralistic stance or that I'm, I'm making judgments on others. I mean, I am that. I'm a consumer. Uh-huh. I don't feel like I'm exempt from that. Right. Um, a lot of it is, it's all personal, you know, like my making a connection with the Dutch Golden Age painters is, um, it, it's a complicated mix of, of resentment and, and judgment of, of what that time period was and what that's the consequences of that early, you know, 
merchant class and, and really the attachment of fine arts to a secular economic based market uh-huh. um, to really just finding that to be the most, the height of oil painting, you know, like that was really in my mind where this medium was, was best utilized. Uh-huh. Um, so it's a, it's a mix. It's a love hate relationship. You know, that, that grape thing is really interesting because number one, I think technically it's, maybe the most difficult thing to paint and paint right is that epicuticular wax on a fluid body. Yeah. You know, it's so and complex. The layers and in requires, between. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, I mean, it requires utilizing underpainting and dead coloring, grisaille, glazing, everything in this tiny little thing. And you're right. What it represented at the time was this sort of opulence, you know, only the wealthiest people could afford grapes at the time. Yeah. So, There's some interesting religious connotations too, with you know, yeah, the, the plum, the well, plum had a lot to do with a, the blood of Christ, right? As as wine, you know, wine is made from the grape as well. Yeah, I, I don't I mean, know if that's your own thing, right? but <laughs> I, I I I saw that too as like to, yeah. to play into it as well. Well, it really it's about a confusion, you know. Like I don't have any real concrete analysis that I can that's precipitating the paintings. And, and having this really precise message, this moral message to tell people. Yeah. Like, I, I'm so confused and conflicted. It's just a mess, you know? It's a mess of personal significance yeah. and, and analysis of history. It's, it's just a mess. <laughs> and I think a lot of times I, I feel like for me and I assume for others that it becomes a part of distortion. So, like, we're taking so many things and like ripping them apart and putting them back together from our own emotional standpoint, from the standpoint of history, from the standpoint of sort of moral obligations and like where you see yourself fitting into the world and then putting them back together into something, which is usually a sort of hodgepodge of all those emotional attachments and things put back together. And And a perfect reflection of where we are, I think that's just distorted and just confused searching you know, just like, where are we? What do we do with this? Yeah, and the problem is, I don't think we ever get to know. I think that's the game, is that it's just the search. Mm-hmm. So, and I think, even like aesthetically, right? Like, I think a lot of times we start distorting things because we we want to, like what I said before, like mix mashing all those things. But I think also, for me, I know that sometimes the viewers want to see a distorted view of something like maybe just giving them a straightforward portraiture isn't enough. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you, we sometimes, you know, I, I imagine in your world, I, I feel like in my world, sometimes I like to like distort things enough to where it's a new world. And maybe that's again, that sort of escapism that we were talking about in painting, like cre- sure. the creation of a new world and even like the under the skin, like distorting reality enough to make it believable, which you as a realist painter, uh, or, you know, with aspects of realism to the way you paint, uh, I think you are able to, you know, successfully do that in like creating a real life, a, a reality that's so obviously not the normal one that we live in day to day. Right. And, that, and that's effectively a trick. It's, it's sure. something to <laughs> yeah. make something, yeah physically beautiful it draws you in and then you're confronted with the abject the grotesque and i think that that tension of attraction repulsion is really you know that that polarity i think is more of a threshold i uh-huh. think you can it's like a there's a lot of value in that and in, in being brought into that space and opening yourself up to it um i mean i'm speaking personally sure. i find a lot of value in that and, you know, this is something I talked to Cleon Peterson about. Um, in terms yeah, of, I listened to that one. You know, he makes a lot of, like, morbid, like, violent, what mm-hmm. some could say, like, grotesque uh, work, where we're in this media, we're in this environment where, like, pretty things are, are like, uh, put to the forefront. We're like, oh, these beautiful things. I find something very interesting from people who can make beautiful things that are also ugly. And I feel like you fall into that category too, in terms of like making beautiful works, but the actual objects themselves have a morbidity, uh, sort of, uh, uh, like 
Like there's something wrong. That makes sense. Mm. And so I, I always look at it like, okay, now, now that you did your work and you put what you need to do into it, once it goes into that market system, I'm always interested to see how people exist by giving the art market things that are both beautiful and grotesque and like, you know what I mean? Like, so do people hang like your paintings above their couches in their living room? You know, I do. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, I'm, I'm always baffled at it to be honest. Like, like I never thought anybody would ever buy my paintings and, you know, so I actually got a, to hedge my bets against that, I went and got a master's degree in a completely non-related field because I was, you know, I, I knew I was, I, I have a love for painting and I, and this particular way of painting. And I just, I got a lot of rejection initially. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, well, I guess I'll just do this in private and do this other thing. And, and things changed, you know, so now I have this degree I don't use and, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's great. Like I can imagine, like a couple, like a a wealthy husband and wife, and the wife's like, "Oh, I really love this painting, and this and that and this," and the husband's like, oh, "I don't like that thing." <laughs> like I, I imagine, yeah. like you would have to have like those types of like debates with people, you know? Yeah, and I'm uh, sure well, they have it for everybody. Lot, it speaks a lot to the person, you know. Like if you're willing to live with something like that, you've done some work, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You've done some work, and that's great. So, I mean, you, you put this stuff out there, you're going to get every type of response and yeah. insult and flattery, you know, it, it all, it's all part of the game. And it's also interesting, I think, that if, uh, if like, let's say somebody who, like, so I had a, the idea that, you know, you were making comments about decadence and wealthies, uh, wealthy people's uh, sort of gluttonous behaviors. And it's funny that, as artists, we are oftentimes speaking about these things in some way or another, talking about the society that we live in. But when it comes down to it, it's also those people who maybe that we're talking about are also supporting the actual act of making art because it, it you know, it's hard to, you know, pay mm-hmm. your bills without selling paintings for a lot of money. They take a long time to make. They take, they cost a lot of money to make, you know, so you got to sell things for a lot of money and the people who can afford to buy the things are usually people who would maybe be uh the context of which maybe some people right. are talking about but, but, but they're not they're not beyond redemption you know like no, that, yeah right if, if if anybody needs the psychic spiritual change it's, it's them you know like right. i think that what a there's no better place for one of my paintings to exist than in some billionaire's home <laughs> you know yeah right do you I find mean, it, it, sorry go ahead well, I, I'm curious. Like, so I've made a lot of paintings where the the um, the point of it gets missed, and it actually gets reinterpreted as the opposite of what it was originally meant to be. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's, it, I'm curious if that would ever be the case for you. If it, yeah, if it, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, more often than not. <laughs> yeah. Right. But it's like. If I myself don't know exactly what I'm doing, then (laughs) chances are it's going to be misinterpreted and that's appropriate. So there's something about uh, finding some comfort in not knowing what the fuck is going on, too, right? Well, and it's taken me a long time to be okay with that. For a long time, I was really insecure because from the outside looking in uh, on what the art world is and, and was and is, it's like you have to have these crystalline ideas that are concepts that precipitate the work you're making and in presenting that work you need to be able to verbally express that as <laughs> yeah. a, a way of like you know people accepting what you're doing and um that that was a really painful reality and it's just not the case i don't feel like that that's true anymore but that yeah. was my perception at the time sure and that could be really binding it, it sort of like put you in a box and not allow you to mm-hmm. experiment and get weird or do anything that maybe yeah. would, doesn't fit that like narrative that you wrote that paragraph about in high school yeah or just or the knowledge. need to justify what you're doing yeah it's, right it's like, all, it's like well you know i'm just a strange person conflicted confused human and this is what i'm doing so i hope you can identify with it if not 
you know. That's why I'm, <laughs> I'm really waiting for my abstract expression days. They're starting. It's getting close. Yeah. It's getting close. Uh, yeah. I, I feel the same way. I went to the Met the other day, and, you know, my, my usual tour is right to the European paintings, kind of get in there, investigate. And, um, you know, I wandered over to this far wing of the Met, which is their contemporary, modern contemporary section. And it was, it had for maybe the first time a really profound effect on me, maybe rethink a lot of things in a scary way, uh-huh. you know, <laughs> like, oh, fuck, yeah. it threatens everything, you know, like, oh, shit, don't look too hard. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've been but, trying to like really tell the rules to go fuck itself. Yeah, like, just well, when really you hitch, do whatever you want. When you hitch the cart to this thing, it's it's difficult, you know. Like yeah. this is this is what's paying the rent and feeding my son. So yeah, then that, that becomes important. Becoming, yeah, it's hard, you know. But it's a big change when you have an extra mouth to feed. Yeah, I wouldn't want it any other way, but sure. it definitely makes it's becoming more complex and more difficult and. The the risk is greater. Yeah. You know? Do you find time to get loose and do some things that uh, maybe don't fit into that bracket? Yeah, I mean, artistically? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, or I bought otherwise. this etching press. Oh, no. Um, so I've been doing monotypes, which is really fun. I mean, it's still a flat artwork, and, you know, they're still relatively figurative, so... Yeah. but they're fast and um, something about working on paper is just less precious. My perception is that it's less precious. Like <laughs> yeah. I just, you know, you can't really work this thing over and over and over. You, it's kind of like an hour and it's done. Yeah. So that's been a real relief because I kind of lost my, um, my appetite to draw, you know, yeah. regrettably. I just really don't like the line and, and, drawing with line i like masses and fluid masses so that's that's been a way to kind of um get back to working out quick ideas yeah sort of I mean, free. there's something nice i know for me like a big part of doing all this stuff is really i just get the high when it's finished like i'm really stoked to have started a task and completed it like regardless mm-hmm. of what happens after it like a big part of it is like okay i did something today like or yeah. like actually finishing something like I feel it like going through a painting I'll ne- I know that a painting will tell me when it's done but as it gets closer to that end like I feel that rush of like the final like <laughs> it's done thing and that becomes yeah. part of why I do it and so I think that there's something intrinsically pleasing for me to do like just some quick things that take only like a couple hours maybe at the most mm-hmm. or whatever or that take like zero actual technical ability Mm -hmm. you know like i've gotten like so my last painting i was like literally like just painting in the lines like coloring in the lines like filling in filling in filling in and i'm like fuck i don't want to fill in i just want to like take a brush and put some fucking paint on it and just smear it right across this fucker and say fuck it like yeah i can totally identify with that and not that i didn't like the piece it's just like i just didn't want to like be like it's, it was like I'm setting I'll, I'll set a set of rules like I'll start a piece and all of a sudden it starts building rules right like oh you have to do this this thing this thing uh-huh. this thing this thing, uh-huh. this thing and then I'm like okay now I'm gonna do the rules like I'm told but meanwhile I'm acting like this fucking renegade artist who could who does whatever he wants and like is totally free and open but really I'm setting rules for myself every day and then like following them yeah. like a good little sheep I you know I, I find that working on a lot of different paintings at once in different stages is really helpful for that because Mm -hmm. I'm really moody, you know, and I, (laughs) I just like, you know, I'll be full of fucking rage and anxious energy and I can't go in and do the tiny little detail work that I, that I can do in a front. I'm at a little bit more of a peaceful state, you know? So like the, the underpaintings tend to be really violent and, uh, I can really (laughs) be, you know, aggressive in that way and be kind of destructive and fast. And that, and that, that for underpainting, that's perfect. You know, you yeah. get, I get the best work done that way. If you try to do an underpainting in a really kind of meticulous, slow way, it doesn't work. Um, so I think having a bunch of paintings going at once is really the answer for me yeah. for being just a movie son of a bitch. <laughs> do you, uh, do you have tattoos? No. Cause you paint tattoos really good. 
it's really fun. I, all I want to do is paint tattoos and makeup and hair. It's really <laughs> like it's really creepy how you make it. You even you. It's almost like you paint jailhouse tattoos. Yeah, yeah. Like people who got tattoos that probably shouldn't have got tattoos from the people they got tattoos from. Yeah. Well, I what I really like is um, when I paint in a tattoo, the paint is wet the flesh glaze is wet Uh and so once you start going into it it's a lot like how i would imagine it is getting a tattoo where once it starts it's there's no turning back (laughs) so once you start putting that wet ink into the wet flesh glaze you know you just have to stick to it and so i like going in without any plan and just making really kind of dumb decisions and then (laughs) sticking to it, you know, yeah, yeah. and then you just sort of have to put the blinders on, finish it and then step back and be like, Oh Jesus. I'll you know tell you what that process that you do, it, it makes the ink look like that perfect blue, like faded. Mm-hmm. It's been in the sun for a while style, like really the black and like the black and gray work over the faces and the skin. Like really, mm-hmm. really good. Yeah. It's fun. And so I did a, one of the paintings in the last show was just this sort of um, kind of ambiguous shape. It could looks like it could be a shoulder, but there's no arm. It just looks like a big hunk of flesh. <laughs> and then this matrix of old and, and new tattoos all over it. And um, I think that's going to be a new direction of work is just having a big hunk of flesh and then having this matrix of old and nat- old and new tattoos um, so that you're, you're reading the surface of an object and then also reading the narrative mm-hmm. provided by the tattoos and also this implication of history of narrative so that within that matrix of tattoos, there's some discernible shapes that, you know, suggest a, a, an earlier time and whatever... Um, lifespan that figure had, and then you have newer tattoos covering it up, but not completely. Yeah, I like that it it suggests this sort of it's the same body but different life or something to that extent. I really, I'm I'm really fascinated with how tattoos are perceived and why people do it, and uh-huh. it creates this visual dissonance, especially face tattoos. You know? Oh yeah, That's I like really that distortion of time thing. too. That you can like sort of play with periods of time yeah. with a single yeah. image yeah nice. and and there, there's that and then the face tattoos so i went from doing tattoos on faces to now i don't know if you even call them tattoos they're just images of faces on these you know distorted heads yeah yeah um i, I really love what that does um to me the viewer and maybe it, the effect is achieved in other people i don't know but I like to see, like you, you, you make contact with the the face that's on the head, and then you recognize the head. Yeah. And there's yeah. this visual dissonance there, where it's almost hard to see them as as uh, a monad. That you see them one or the other, but then the the oneness of the two is the difficult part. You know, uh, I really, I really like together. that. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Um. I want to thank you again for uh, for taking the time to shoot the shit with us. Can we yeah. send some people your way? Uh, check out your stuff on the Facebooks, the Twitters, Instagram. Yeah, I, I, I do the Instagram thing. I don't know if uh, we're Instagram friends. We've been Facebook friends forever. I think we are. Are we Instagram friends? Okay. Yeah, uh, it's Van underscore Minnen, M-I-N-N-E-N. Okay, yeah, I think we are. And Yeah, I mean, you, you can find me. I have a pretty, I'm, out, I'm out there. What uh, You got anything on the horizon? Um, um, I'm working on some paintings for Pulse coming up here in New York with a gallery, Pulsen, my, my Copenhagen gallery. Uh-huh. So that's March 3rd. Nice. So that's it. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, you feel pretty good about this thing? We got, yeah, we got yeah, about an hour fun. done. Yeah, it was really fun. Thanks for having me. I've been looking forward to doing this. And yeah. I really, I apologize. You know, it's taken so long. It's, it's no problem. I, I admire that you do it and, you know the the longevity of this thing is really impressive. Yeah, man, I and, appreciate uh, it. I mean, I listen to it all the time in my studio, so thanks. Right. So, are you, you're gonna have to listen to yourself now. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten so used to hearing my own voice; it doesn't bother me at all. I'm uh-huh. so pretentious. That must be nice. That must be nice. <laughs> 
All right, let's do internet dap. Okay. okay. Here we go. Boom. Bam. Nice. Thank All you, right. brother. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, thanks. hopefully, if you ever get out this way, not uh, you, you show in LA at all? No, not really. But right. well, if you get uh, out here, let's link up. And uh, I got to make a New York trip soon. Okay. Yeah, I'd love to have you over. All right, brother. Thanks a lot. Okay. I appreciate it. Have a yep. good day. Yeah. Later. Bye. All right. There you go. Sweet. Another one in the books. Yep. All right. So maybe we'll be back next Friday. Yes. Actually. I'm scheduled to work next week. Ah! Ah! That's All my right, birthday, too. Oh, uh, yeah, no, no, no. Well, uh, shit. Well, happy work birthday. Yeah. All right, brother. All right, Thanks. Cutters that apply through your summers in the sky. Collar pop, Jolly Roger, die, motherfucker, die. A patch you on a ship shape in Bristol fast. And snuck a jammy through the red tape and tiptoe past them. Warm teeth winding feverishly below. His little organic axle is eager to feed and grow. So when his black cork go to the glass, walk me surface up through the cash crops. Clippers for your belly up mascots and never dine alone. Meanwhile, back at sea level, it was home by home, zone for zone. Boom County's homeless, riot for home ownership. I hope to put gas in the motor home and know the roads. Studied with the finest comb stuck under my thumb as opposed to the loaded nose who pray Armageddon is numb and that's unevenly rendered to those who grew up thinking faith was the surrender of reason but not a reason to surrender. Uh, catch the Liberty Fires catalog, 40 torch orchids and citronella for Algernon, Donna Vagabondo like repent, this shit should have been Beta Burns Babylon the end. And when the radio stars climbed the battle of the floors to murder the media and the shot of 30 years before they said, I know love lost, baby, the future is so bright. Since charm like an armored car Taking the clone farm charts to the arms bizarre We were the homemade marker makers Born in Port of Marsh Ink in a right guard Parts and marched to the call of the car alarms No harps, no delusions Illusion with something prettier than ash Around a metacarpal still clutching the teddy bears Break and run with scissors Through the city fair Or situate the nuzzle with a subtle art of splitting hair Double park the shuttle Summer lark the funnel Cutty sark for budding narcs Target the gushing heart in the muddy clarks so These are the vices that appear Bastards who will chew it every tablet, blurdy axioms fastest. Crews lose lunches, but a hundred lose electricity, lose gas, phone plumbing, hum and keep your mouth closed, keep your cows cloned. Go, I am the post of this fucking town, homes. No, my with a convenient embargo. At least I'll always know what side of the gun I'm supposed to buy the farm from. The two fork gun kicks, still in a box, fixed, still in a pill in a sock, chilling, gill in a slot, in a million watch, giddy and scrubs. But once the arc on her pussy and bribes, the animals will divide and that's a win for the garage. You keep charity in the parish for profiting off the lack of a marriage amongst the class. When the radio stars climb to battle the floors to murder the media and the shot of 30 years before they said, And when the cutters and the pine through their summers in the sky, no love lost, baby, the future is so bright. Tree is so postal, coasting to the quotient, provoking a local pistol. Pete choking his liberty and justice quarters and cloaking his folk and smithereens. Smoky little pile of bloody pulp and codependencies. Uh, dopey, no surrender, bender in effect. Soul defenders at the longest night New York had never slept. And never jumping jacks and whistlers over Christmas. Like rockets from the crypt, spilling a festive morning beverage in your preference. I'm stepping hog heaven, stony with no weapons. Pissing on teleprompters, selling megaphones for hecklers. Who broadcast 80 million versions of the sermon. For that one indisputable masterpiece before the curtains Hail Arcadian moon high definition flat plasma IMAX city wide transfer Artificial Einstein rosin out the tenement Ease into the Xanadu let it hammer the tension out Talking cool calm dominant phenomenon